So we've been going through a chronological study of the Gospels, which just means that we are trying to look at the Gospels and the events in the Gospels as they would have happened historically. So uh, if you're looking at a timeline uh, of your life, let's say, uh, and we were to look at that timeline of your life, we would start uh, back here, uh, and if we want to start at your birth, we can. If we want to go back a little bit farther and we want to look at your conception, we can, because we ultimately understand that life begins there, not at birth. Uh, and, but we look at your timeline of your life and we say, okay, well, this happened, you were born, and then this happened, you had your first birthday, and then this happened, and then this happened. And so we would look at that in kind of an order. If you've ever put together a scrapbook, uh, you usually would start, and normally a scrapbook isn't just something that is thrown together and like, okay, well, the first birthday is like on page 37 and second birthday is on page 22. It's normally not all jumbled up. And so what we're doing is we're taking a chronological look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so some of them, uh, we would call them the synoptic gospel, Gospels, which would be Matthew, Mark, and Luke, record many of the same events. But then you have the Gospel of John, which records many different events. And so we're trying to look at them as they actually would have taken place. And, and so today we are working our way up to, and we're going to be in Matthew. We're going to start in Matthew chapter number 3, just bringing into context our study from last week. Last week we looked at the baptism of Jesus. And again, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Matthew chapter number 3. And I'm going to start reading in verse number 16 in just a moment. Matthew chapter number 3. Verse number 16. So this is looking back to last week, the baptism of Jesus. And uh, here's what we read. Verse number 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God. When it says he saw the Spirit of God, it's talking about John. John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. And lighting on him. Now the him there is talking about Jesus. So John saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and landing on Jesus. And it says this, verse number 17, And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Well, we move into chapter number 4. And in chapter number 4, starting in verse number 1, it says this, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. I'm going to read that verse again. Then Jesus. Now the word then means after he was baptized. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Now just as there are parallel passages for many of the texts that we've already looked at, there are parallel passages to this one. So we've looked at Matthew. If you have your Bibles again, flip over to Mark chapter number 1. And we're going to see the same thing take place. Starting in verse number 10. Mark chapter number 1, verse number 10. We read this. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, and if this sounds familiar, it's because it's a parallel passage. We already read it, just in Matthew, now we're reading in Mark. A voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. And at once the Spirit sent him out into the desert. I'm going to read that again. At once, this is verse number 12, at once the Spirit sent him out into the desert. And he was in the desert 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and angels that attended him. Another parallel passage is found in Luke chapter number 4. So if you would be picking up uh, the Bible and you would just be reading through, you would find this account in each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Luke chapter number 4, starting in verse number 1, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert. Where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. Now there are a couple of very clear things in this passage. The first clear thing in these passages that we have read was that Jesus was baptized, and immediately after his baptism, 
the Holy Spirit led him into direct confrontation with Satan. Now, that's important to make sure that you didn't miss that in any of the passages. The Holy Spirit led Jesus directly into temptation. Directly into temptation. There's, there's no way of getting around it being God's plan for a Jesus to have gone into temptation. You can't get around that. It's very clear. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by, by the devil. That's in Matthew. Immediately, Jesus, at once, it says, he was led into the desert to be tempted uh, by, by the devil. And, and so a couple of lessons. And I'm going to give you the first lesson. And it's going to take a while to get to the second one. And we're going to have a lot of sub points in between. But the first lesson that we need to learn is this. Jesus came as the second Adam. Or he might be referred to as the last Adam. And if you recall, the first Adam, when tempted by the devil, did what? Gave in to that temptation. The first Adam, you remember Adam and Eve, at creation. They were created in the image of God. But when tempted by the devil, you'll remember that they chose the devil's temptation, his, his allurement over God's will. And so the second Adam is coming, or the last Adam, and that is Jesus. And you see a lot of parallels. And if you, if you want to at some point, we're not going to look through it in depth today. But if you would look in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, you would see these parallels. And I'm just going to give you some of them. So Adam, when we're, when we're talking about Adam, the first Adam, uh, he was the first man. Whenever we're talking about Christ... He was the last Adam. So we have the first Adam and the last Adam. Adam and Eve over here, the first Adam. Jesus Christ, the last Adam over here. If you would look in, in, in the scriptures in Genesis 2, we see that, that man, Adam, was made a living soul. If you look in 1 Corinthians 15, and you can see this in John 5 as well. You can also see it in John chapter number 6, that Jesus was made a quickening spirit. So you have Adam made a living soul, Jesus a quickening spirit, it says. Uh, what, what is known about Adam is that he was a natural man, and then we understand that Jesus is a spiritual man. We see this in 1 Corinthians 15, 46. Uh, we see that the origin of Adam is from the earth. He's made of the dust of the ground. The origin of Jesus is from heaven. He's God's one and only begotten son. And so there are parallels between them. If we just kind of look at one of the big parallels, it would be this. Adam's one act of rebellion, sin against God, choosing the allurement of what Satan had in front of him. Adam's one act, it did what? It brought death to all hu the whole hu human race. It brought judgment and it brought condemnation. Adam's act of rebellion against God choosing the allurement of Satan's devices and his plan and his what he had put in front of them it brought death judgment and condemnation but through the obedience of Christ and again we're seeing a parallel but a great contrast in the parallel between the first Adam and the last Adam what Christ's one act what his obedience in going to the cross and living a sinless life, it brought life. It brings us grace, justification, righteousness, and we get to reign with him as co-heirs in Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I would take the last Adam and what he provides over the first Adam and what he provided. So whenever we think about this and we realize that the first Adam was created in the image of God and then Satan comes to him and Satan comes to he and Eve and tempts them. This time, God's taking the battle right to Satan. He's not waiting for Satan to come to Jesus. God is saying, listen, the baptism has just taken place and that baptism started Jesus' public ministry and as soon as the baptism is over, what happens? God says, I'm going to take the battle 
to Satan. Satan's not going to control this. Satan's not going to have a say in this. I'm taking it right to him. And so the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into temptation. And you say, whoo, that's a bold move. Because we must understand that Jesus is fully human. Jesus is fully human. Yes, he's the God-man. He's completely God, but he's also completely man. And he was taken there to be tempted by the devil. I was talking to Kim about this a little bit last night, and as we were talking about this, she's like, yeah, but it was Jesus. And so, like, you would know that Jesus wouldn't give in to that temptation. And, and certainly we understand that, that Jesus did not give in to that temptation but the reality is, is that he was put in a situation where he was either going to be obedient to the will of his father or he was going to, as the first Adam did, choose to rebel against his father. He was put into that situation, the same situation as what we had the first Adam. The second Adam goes into it, except again, this time God is saying, I'm taking the battle right there. He was led by the spirit. Now, a couple of cautions. The first caution is this. Realize that God's plan for Jesus as the second Adam or the last Adam, it is different than his plan for us as Christ followers. We need to understand because it would be very easy to just look at this one verse and say, oh, well, Jesus is going to take me into direct battle with Satan too. That's just what he's going to do with believers like that's what he did with Jesus. That's what he's going to do with all Christ followers. We are not the second Adam. We are not the last Adam. We were not born without a sin nature. We have no opportunity to provide redemption for anyone other than for ourselves. And we don't even get to provide that. It's been provided for us. We just exercise the faith to have it applied to our account. And so we need to understand we're not the second Adam. There is one first Adam who gave in to the temptation of Satan. There is one second Adam or last Adam who was obedient to his father in all things. This test is not still put out there. This test is not something that God is saying, okay, I need to directly confront Satan with you. That he was directly confronting Satan with the second Adam. With the first Adam, Satan got the upper hand, it would have appeared, right? Because Adam chose to rebel against Almighty God and chose to follow Satan. He chose that path. He chose the allurement of, oh, hey, if you'll eat this, you'll be like God. Oh, man, God's holding out. So in the second Adam, again, this is, there's only one first Adam and there's only one second Adam or last Adam. And that battle's already been won. That battle's already been won. And so that battle doesn't need to be fought again. So God took the battle directly to Satan with the second Adam. Jesus told the disciples, and by extension, I think he teaches us. When he teaches us how to pray, and we find this in Matthew chapter number 6. You're probably already in Matthew. If you flip over just a couple of chapters, you'll see this. He teaches the disciples how to pray, and by extension, teaches us how to pray. And let's read what that looks like together, starting in verse number 9 of Matthew chapter number 6. It says this, This then is how you should pray. And if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, these words are going to be in red. This is Jesus saying it. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy, be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. What did the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit led the last Adam directly into temptation. Jesus says, pray to the Father, lead us not into temptation, but instead deliver us from the evil one. Well, what it doesn't mean in this verse is that God will never lead us into temptation. You might infer because we're told to pray, lead us not into temptation, that God will just never, ever put us into a situation where we're tempted. That would never be his will. But let's think even just practically for a moment. By God allowing us to live, he is putting us 
by, by extension into opportunities to be tempted, right? I mean, the simple fact that I'm alive and I interact with people, and I wouldn't even have to interact with people to be tempted, but the simple fact that I'm alive and that I get the opportunity to interact with people, I get the opportunity to uh, lead a family, I get the opportunity to, and you just kind of fill in the blank, the fact that God allows us to live means that we're going to be tempted. And depending upon your understanding of the sovereignty of God, you would then understand that by extension, the fact that he has allowed us to live means that he is okay with us being tempted. It is part of his plan or his will that we face opportunities for, for temptation. Now, before you say, well, I thought you said God wasn't going to take the battle right to Satan. Let's realize this. Satan can be in one place at one time. Satan is not omnipresent. Satan is not God. Satan does not have the power to be here and in China at the same time. He's just not. And so we need to understand that God isn't saying to us, there's a battle to be won. I need you to, to strike a blow to Satan's head. I need you to strike this blow to Satan by you going and you being victorious in this temptation. He did that in Christ. He did that in Christ. However, God allows us and even leads us into opportunities for temptation. Now, it's very important to distinguish what God wants from that. We have the mistaken idea that when God allows us to be tempted or leads us into an opportunity for temptation, that means that he's leading us to sin. Take that thought for a moment because I think most people have that thought, well, if God allows us to be tempted, then he wants us to sin or he's leading us to sin. But no, he led Jesus to temptation. Did he in any way lead him to sin? No. What did God lead Jesus to? He led him to victory. Satan viewed it as an opportunity for Jesus to deny God. Satan viewed it as an opportunity for Jesus to rebel against God's plan, to be disobedient to the Father. But God was looking at this and saying, listen, I'm giving my son, my one and only son, the last Adam, the second Adam, I'm giving him the opportunity for victory. And so when Jesus or when God or the Holy Spirit leads you into an opportunity for temptation, you know what he's doing? He's giving you an opportunity for victory. We have unfortunately been accustomed to believe that temptation is equal to sin. Well, I was tempted and I just, I, there's no way I could stand up under that temptation. No. Satan might be looking at temptation and you might even look at temptation as like, oh no, I'm going to sin. God looks at temptation as an opportunity for you to have victory. He's looking at it and saying, yes, you're going to face this, but you have opportunity for obedience. You have opportunity for victory. I want you to think for a second as a parent. Think for a second. Have you ever been in a situation where you didn't know how your kids would respond when they were tempted? Or when they were given the opportunity for either right or wrong, you're like, oh man, I wonder how they would do. Uh, there's, a, there's a show, uh, and it's called What Would You Do? John Quinones, I might say his name slightly wrong, has this show. And uh, they've done an experiment like this, and I feel like I might have seen that, to, that the Today Show may have done something similar to this as well, where they take children of parents uh, known to the network, and in a safe environment, they create a, a van, uh, they have a guy that has a van, and in this van, he has some really nice stuff, and he goes onto the street and tries to convince the kids to get into the van to check out what he's got in there. It might be a puppy. It might be something really, really cool. And, and so all the parents are thinking, okay, my kid knows. I've told them over and over and over again. You don't go with a stranger. You don't go with a stranger. You never allow yourself to get taken into the situation. The parents were going into this saying, all right, this is an opportunity for me to see that my child is going to do what's right. I have trained my child well. And, and many, many times, and it, it's kind of sad almost to watch the parents 
sit in a, an enclosed room and watch one child after another go in to see this puppy or go in to see what this person has that, that's so special. And it's like, oh, my goodness, they could have been kidnapped just like that. But the parent was looking at this and saying, I, I'm giving my child an opportunity for victory. I'm giving my child an opportunity to do what's right. I feel like they've been trained well. And then whenever they failed, you know what I saw each and every time? The parents sat down with their child and lovingly taught them what they did wrong. God has no desire for you to fail. God has not brought you into a situation to watch you fail. He just hasn't. What you are going through in life is not God's way of saying, I'll get you to screw up. That's a pretty sad parent that would say, ah, I bet you if I put my kid in this situation, they'll screw up. I don't think, I, I don't know the parent. I'm sure there's some pretty messed up wacko parents out there. I, I understand that. I understand that. But for, for parents who love their children, they put them in situations where, yes, they will be tested. Yes, they will be given opportunities to choose right or wrong. But they do everything in their power to set them up for victory, not for failure. And as I see God and what he's doing in our lives, he gives us the opportunity to face temptation. But he always desires for us to succeed, to resist that temptation, to gain victory. And when we gain victory, we gain confidence in allowing us simply to live. And I said this earlier, God is allowing us to face situations where we're going to be tempted. We live in an evil, sinful world. I mean, have you watched the news lately? We live in an evil, a sinful world. So simply by living, we're allowed to be tempted. And our prayer is, God, don't lead us into temptation. The follow-up to that is, but deliver us from the evil one and if we use the whole of scripture instead of just a little part let's look at what 1 Corinthians 10 13 says 1 Corinthians 10 verse number 13 so chapter 10 verse 13 1 Corinthians no temptation has seized you except what is common to man and check this out and God is faithful he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. God will not lead you into a temptation where he knows that you don't stand a chance. He won't lead you into a temptation that you can't resist. He won't do it. And if you, I've heard it said before, but Pastor Dave, I just can't resist that. Yes, you can. If you're facing it as a child of God, you can resist it. How do I know? The authority of God's word. God is faithful. These are, these are his words, not mine. These are not my words. Look at your Bible. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. It almost sounds exactly like the Lord's prayer. Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. When we do face that temptation, deliver us from the evil one. He'll provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. And I hear a lot of people, sometimes even theologians, will use James chapter number 1. So we just looked at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. We're going to look at James 1, 13. I hear people all the time say, God won't lead you into temptation. Look at James 1. James 1, 13 says this. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. I wholeheartedly agree. That's God's word. God isn't tempting you. There is nothing in scripture that says God will not allow you to be tempted. If so, my Christian walk has been really messed up. God must have forgotten when it came to me that I'm not supposed to be tempted. Let me just ask you, since becoming a follower of Christ, how many of you have been tempted? All right, the rest of you are either blind um, or some sort of a robot that I don't quite understand. Uh, or you just like, I don't ever raise my hand. The reality is this, we're going to be tempted. And if we're tempted, which we are, 
then God has allowed that to come into our life, right? We are facing this temptation, but don't say that God is the one actually tempting because here's, can I get two volunteers? I need two volunteers. Oh, come on. All right, come on. All right, Angel and Cassie. All right, this is good. Which one of you wants to be good? Which one of you wants to be bad? <laughs> You'll be good? <laughs> She's like, I'll be good. <laughs> All right, so you're going to stand over here, Angel. You're going to stand over here. Kind of sounds bad having Angel be the one that's the bad one. <laughs> All right, so, so you are going to represent God, okay? And you are going to represent sin. Or at least you have black on. I mean, you know. All right. So, so okay. In any given situation, if God allows me to go into this temptation, his desire is that I resist that temptation and I am obedient here. So if God's desire, when he allows us to be tempted, is not that we go here. God, so, so swap over here for a second. Just go right down there. No, no, no. You can stay right here. You go off the stage for a second. Yep, just right down there. All right, so it is not as if God is over there pulling me to do wrong. That would be God tempting us to do wrong. The scriptures here in James say when, when you're tempted, don't say you're tempted of God because God can't be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So God is never over there saying, oh, go this way, go this way, go towards evil. No, instead, go ahead and swap back over here, Cassie. Instead, when God allows us to face temptation, God is over here drawing us to do what is right. Do you see the difference? He allows us to come into these situations, but he is never the one over here luring us in, oh, do what's right. That would be God tempting us to do evil. And God never tempts us to, to do evil. Does that make sense? You two can sit down. Thank you so much for your help. God's never the one drawing us to do wrong. That's temptation. But it's clear that God allows us in situations where we have the opportunity for either obedience or disobedience. And just as a loving parent desires for their children in those situations to do the right thing. You ever told your kids to do something, you kind of turn the corner and then you just wait? I'm probably the only one that's ever done that. And you kind of listen, and it's like, okay, what's going on right about now, right? You want so badly for them to do what is right, and that is God. That is God. He is wanting us to do what is right. The tempter is the one luring you or drawing you to do wrong. Satan's influence, honestly, your own lusts draw you to do what is wrong, but God draws us to do what is right. Even in God taking Jesus directly into temptation, God was drawing Jesus to obedience, not drawing him to sin. God was drawing his one and only begotten son to obedience, not to sin. And you know what it does whenever we are obedient rather than sinful? It deals a little blow to Satan's influence in this world. It really does. When we are obedient rather than sinful. Because, and I just got to tell you, you've heard this if you've grown up in church at all. I, I hear people say, I'm going to sin every day. I, that, dry, that, that whole statement just drives me nuts. It's a defeatist attitude as if we can't resist temptation. As if God is just saying, ah, you stink. You know, you're going to give in and you're going to fail. And you know what? There are going to be times that we are. But why go into it when our Father, God wants us to do right and He's drawing us to obedience and He's given us everything we need. He's given us His Spirit. He's given us those things to do what is right. Why go into it saying, I'm just going to screw up every day. I'm going to be a complete failure. I'm going to sin. I'm going to stink. I, I hate saying the word suck. So it's, it almost sounds better in this situation. But, um, but, why do that? Why be defeatist when God wants victory? So God takes Jesus. You can't deny it. It's inescapable. Takes Jesus directly into temptation. I said there were two lessons. Whew, I'm getting worn out. I said there were two lessons. The first one is that God isn't going to lead you into direct confrontation with Satan that you wouldn't be able to handle. He's not going to do that. He knew that Jesus could handle it, and he sent Jesus directly into that conflict. But he will allow you to be tempted, and he may take you into specific confrontations with sin to allow you to be victorious. 
again, to allow you to be victorious. So Jesus came as the second Adam or the last Adam. And if you recall, the first Adam, when tempted by the devil, rejected God's will. The second Adam did not. The second Adam was obedient. So that's the first thing. God sent Jesus as the second or the last Adam. That's the first lesson. He fought that battle. He didn't sin. He was the, the perfect sacrifice. That's Jesus. We are not the second Adam. The second one is simply this. And I'm almost done. It's crazy because the children's workers are going to be like, what in the world's going on out there? But the second one is this. It is common for a time of great temptation to follow a great spiritual victory. It is oh so common for a time of great temptation to follow a great spiritual victory. You get one of those quote unquote mountaintop experiences. And it's like, oh, well, I'm good to go now. And so often after a great spiritual victory, there's a time of great temptation. And I want you to be prepared for that. I don't want you to let your guard down. We're going to take some students to camp this week. When we're at camp, we are challenged daily. One of the awesome things about camp, and, and the students I think know this to at least some degree, uh, is that they're away from their electronic devices. They're not just like drawing them in all the time, like, hey, what's going on on social media? They don't have all of that. They're, they're surrounded by a good influence. Uh, a lot of things are set up for them to be able to just focus on, okay, what is it that God wants to do in my life? Okay, so camp is a pretty, pretty awesome situation. And, and many times they're challenged and they make decisions for Christ. It might be decisions uh, that are to give up certain things. It might be decisions to walk in a certain way. But many times they are challenged and they do make great spiritual decisions. I, for one, I came to know Christ as my Savior at a church camp. Uh, I was at uh, another camp whenever God called me into full-time ministry. Uh, and, and so I value the camp experience a lot. I know what getting away and being able to focus on God can do. But I also know how right after that is a time of great temptation. And so I need for all of you, whether it be teens or adults, I need you to know this. Like having spiritual victory does not guarantee future spiritual victory. Having a spiritual victory does not guarantee future spiritual victory. You need to stay close to the Lord. Jesus was baptized. His father says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And what happens next? Temptation directly. It says for 40 days. If you read in Matthew, you might get the, the, the idea that, okay, he was out in the wilderness for 40 days and then he was tempted like for this short period. But if you read in Mark and Luke, you understand that for those entire 40 days, he's facing direct temptation from Satan. So he's hungry. He's physically drained. And yet he's completely reliant upon the Father. So, first lesson is pretty simple. You are not the second Adam. You are not the last Adam. God has already taken, taken the battle right to Satan. And Jesus was victorious. And he gives us the opportunity for victory too. And then the second lesson is simply this. Let's make sure that whenever we have spiritual victory, we don't let down our guard. Because we're likely to face temptation. I know for me personally, some of the toughest times emotionally for me are right after something phenomenal happens. I don't know what it is. Like, we'll have a Super Bowl party. I'll see kids come to know Christ, and the next day I'll be down. It's weird. I almost never get down. Uh, but, but it's one of the more difficult times after those spiritual victories because it's like, okay, well, what's next? And I want you to know that God leads you into temptation not to see you fail, but to give you additional opportunities for victory. Never wants you to fail. God's on your side. He's fighting for you, and he gives you a way of escape. Lord, thank you for your word. I thank you that the second Adam, Jesus, was completely obedient to the Father. God, I thank you that Jesus was not just a fitting sacrifice, but the perfect, acceptable sacrifice that satisfied the wrath of God. 
I thank you that you have then given all mankind the opportunity through faith to trust in Jesus as the one and only Savior, the one and only Deliverer. I thank you that when you send us into temptation, that you don't ever send us into fail because you don't tempt us. You are not luring us to do wrong, but you are giving us opportunities for obedience and victory to do what is right and holy. So, so may we view temptation completely different. For most of my life, I have viewed temptation only as the opportunity to do wrong. But I thank you for the perspective that you have given to me that the temptation to do wrong gives the opportunity to do right. The opportunity to be obedient to you, God. And I thank you that you rejoice in that, that you don't ever send us into a situation where we can't handle it. There's no temptation that is, is too hard for us to resist or you wouldn't allow us to face it. So God, may we all collectively view this differently, that God, you set us up for victory. You set us up for obedience. You don't set us up for failure. And I praise you for that. You are a good God who loves us deeply. Thank you. In Jesus' name.